It's time to begin our class this morning, and uh, as we do all the time, I think it's a good thing we ask God's blessing on our joining together today. And so uh, we're going to have an opening prayer, and Willie's going to offer that prayer this morning. Most Christian Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us. Jesus, thank you for your willingness to be sacrificed for us so that we may have the forgiveness of our sins and uh, life eternal with you. Help us to uh, hear what you want us to hear through this lesson. And uh, this week, go about our week doing what you want us to do and how you want us to do it to please you. In your most gracious heavenly name, amen. It's good to have Mike here. Uh, and it was good to have the WEI thing last week. I think it was uh, encouraging to all of us who were here. And um, we... We left off in Psalm 5 14 days ago, and so we're going to pick up there and go forward with uh, our examination of what David is saying in Psalm 5. <coughs> so where we left off two weeks ago in Psalm 5, David is praying concerning a problem that he cannot fully put into words to God. And he pauses before he even prays. He's, he's courageous en enough to step into prayer to God for some kind of solution to this problem. But he recognizes his own iniquity and feels that may be a hindrance to him before God. And of course, David lived in a time when the things of Christ and the, you know, like Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives. And David probably knew something of that, but he didn't know as clearly as we do that Christ is kind of an intermediary for us in our prayer. But I think David sensed that, but he, he it was shadowy. So it could be that he, his, he felt like his own iniquity could prevent him from approaching God. And if he was pr prevented from his petition to God, what's he going to do with this problem that he identifies when we get down into verses 8, 9, and 10, his petition to God, this thorny problem that he sees. And so he feels like he needs to seek God's leading, he needs God to make things smooth for him, to clear the debris, to lay down his steps so that when he steps, he's going in the right direction. He pleads on God's mercy as he comes in to pray. And so then now trusting God's promise to hear him, then he boldly presents his prayer. It's pretty short. The problem is that is besetting him. He lays before God, and uh, it begins in verse 8 and continues through verse 10. His concern is regarding his foes and their use of their tongue or their words. So this is the text, and you see, you'll see in here that David is pleading for God, first of all, to clear his path. And then he mentions his foes, almost kind of in passing. He says, O oh Lord, lead me in your righteousness because of my foes. Make your way straight before me. And then he goes into the kind of the meat of his petition. There is nothing reliable in what they say. Their inward part is destruction itself. Their throat is an open grave. They're, they flatter with their tongue. Hold them guilty, O God, by their own devices. Let them fall. 
in the multitude of their transgressions. Thrust them out, for they are rebellious against you. So these foes, I mean, we'll call them flatterers. I think the, the different descriptions back in that last verse of where it's talking about what they say, their inward part, their throat, their tongue, all of these things are kind of Hebraic parallelisms to try to get the point across because it's not an easy concept. It really is a difficult thing to understand what David is struggling with, but so he uses kind of a four-part thing here, but it's still talking all about the same thing. It's about people who using their tongue, something that's coming up from outside of them, it is words and that kind of thing. So he calls them flatterers, so we're going to kind of refer to that. We, I don't think we talk about flatterers much, but it, uh, the word for foes actually in Hebrew is my watchers. It's kind of a weird juxtaposition almost, it feels like. And watchers appear all throughout history. Jesus had a lot of watchers. You know, think of all the time the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus and s said, we've been watching you, why are you doing that? Or they come to him and they say, we've been watching you and we have a question for you. And usually it was kind of a trick question, right? They wanted to catch him in something. But they were watching him. And Jesus was aware of this, and I think David is aware of it too. David is aware of the watchers that are around him. Now these watchers or these foes are people close to David. I think even regular people, they're not like, you know, like politicians and or they're not even necessarily maybe the high people in the religious order. They're not carefully crafting, you know, obvious people. They're just kind of like, whatever this is that David's concerned about has sort of found its way into everything in life in Israel. And we know this by looking at other passages in the scripture where the Israelites, you know, they had a religion after a sort. It looked very religious, but many, many of them were they had something on the side and it, we could call it idolatry of one kind or another, different colors, but they would have two ways of, of moving through life. And I think this is kind of what we see here with these foes. They use words and the scripture refers to the things that they do as devices. They use devices. Uh, that entrap people. And so David then, when he, as he sees this, it, it feels almost hopeless. He almost can't define it, I think. But he knows that he can hope in God and that God's hand is higher than even the devices of his watchers. And David sees these problems, but his help comes from God. Uh, sorry about the mix-up on the overlay here, but these foes are truly worse than enemies with swords. If somebody comes at you with a knife, you can see it coming, and you can block it, or you can put your shield up, or something like that. And of course, they can kill you or hurt you, but you at least have a have a moment or you can make strategies for that kind of thing but the flatterers use their tongue and it's the very method that Satan used to beguile Eve and Adam and he said things like this will make things better try this God's been holding out on you you know, don't, don't believe what he said. I'm telling you, this is going to be much better for you. 
That sounds lovely, doesn't it? Uh, wouldn't you all, wouldn't we all love to have somebody show us that perfect place and hear those perfect words? Yeah, Jim. Flattery appeals to our ego and pride and uh, it's difficult to not get taken in and not be drawn to it like a moth to a flame. Yeah, what do you think Eve thought when she first heard that? I mean, if I was Eve, I would have thought, wait, God told us not to eat of that tree. But then it, if that little thought for a moment, if it was even there, just like evaporated and she said, oh yeah, that's beautiful. And Satan used his words to say, yeah, and it tastes good too. And you will gain knowledge that God has withheld from you. But, as David says here in Psalm, in Psalm 5, their inward parts are evil. Sounds good, but it's rotten at the core. They appear pleasant to David, I think, as he walked through the city of Jerusalem and he sees these people and they have, everybody has good words, they say the right things, but they always have, not all of them, because, you know, but a lot of them, they always, they have other self-serving motives for why they use these smooth words and destructions within them. And again, they are only, as David calls them, <clears throat> open sepulchers. That's like a grave, you know, it's a place where bones would be kept of someone who had, had died. Open sepulchers of the foulest order and full of rank evil, enemies of God. So on the one hand, they appear pleasant and religious and wonderful and enticing and even in a way. But on the other hand, they're deep down full of evil. Um, they're destructive. So in the Psalms, there are several passages, 38 places in the Psalms and Proverbs where this topic of flatterer, flatterers, is mentioned and we'll just mention a couple of them and briefly because especially in Psalm 12 here because this Psalm 12 shines a lot of light on this question that David is struggling with he says help O Lord for the godly man ceases to be okay he, he's not even even the people that used to be godly that were walking about the city of Jerusalem they're not there anymore for the faithful disappear from among the sons of God. They speak falsehood to one another with flattering lips and with a double heart they speak. So there, I think this kind of puts flattering lips and double heart kind of together and helps us understand a little bit more what's going on here. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, David says, or the the actual translation of that verse is, the Lord will cut off all flattering lips. The tongue that speaks great things, who have said, and this is the flatterers, they say, and I don't think they say this to just out to anybody, they say it within themselves. With our tongue, we will prevail. Our lips are our our own. Who is Lord over us? Because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy, God says, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him, you know, as the afflicted person, I will set him in safety for which he longs. So this is what David is, is dealing with. It's and people are afflicted, people are devastated by what's going on among 
these groups of people that use their tongue. So double heart, double mind, flattery, kind of all are similar concepts. And um, <coughs> you know that the double heart in Hebrew is called a heart and a heart, two hearts. And it has a lot of comparison to the idea of having multiple sets of weights for measuring in the marketplace. Different size stones for buying than you have for selling. And so that's kind of directly where this concept of double mind or double heart comes from. You look one way, you present things one way, but really there's something else going here that nobody sees, but they are made victim of it. So false weights and unequal, unequal measures uh, in Proverbs 20, uh, the Lord detests double standards of every kind. <laughs> and here we have this problem of double standard in the hearts of the people that David is seeing. Here's another verse in Psalm 36. Transgressions speak to the ungodly within his heart. You know, there is no fear of God before his eyes. This is not a simple, you know, it's not a passable thing. It, it, seems, one, it seems like that his heart is good, but there is no fear of God. He flatters himself in his own eyes concerning the discovery of his iniquity and the hatred of it. The word of his mouth, the wickedness and deceit, he has ceased to be wise and to do good. So I think, I hope it's clear in these passages, seems to me to be so, that there, there's nothing good in this flattering activity. And I think David, you know, I think the other thing is, I think we have to keep in mind that you don't see it very clearly. It looks one way, but it is another way. There's two hearts, two minds. And so David feels this flow very strongly as he goes about his job of being king of Israel. But on the other hand, it's not very well perceived. It's not like he can say, okay, bring me an armor, army of, you know, a thousand men with swords and shields, and we'll go in and we'll wipe out these flatterers. I don't think he, he's like, more like, I don't know what to do with this. But I see it, but I don't know how to deal with it. It looks one way. It looks okay but it has a different effect on the people and their faith. So flattery is not something that we, we don't think much about, I don't think. Uh, many think of flattery as like being complimentary or complimenting somebody, saying something good about somebody. I remember one time I asked Fred uh, Reamer to fill in for teaching here one day when I had to be out of town. And it was when he had just first come here. And uh, I, I didn't know, I'd never sat in Fred's classes or been in Fred's uh, sermons or anything like that in the past. But I, I thought, well, this is a guy that has been preaching all over the whole Northwest, you know? So he must have something to say. So I took, a, yes, you would say took a chance, hoping that he would, he would do well. And then I, after I came back from my trip, I asked a couple people, how was the class last week? And, and uh, how was Fred's teaching that day? And they said, well, he was really good. In fact, he was extremely good. And, um, you know, he, 
we don't want you to be the teacher anymore. We want Fred to be the teacher. <laughs> and um, so anyway, I went to Fred. I bought him a, a gift certificate to uh, Dairy Queen because that's what old men like, isn't it? <laughs> and I, I gave it to him and I said, Fred, you've surpassed any expectations I would have had. I'm so grateful. And you have gi you give so much to this congregation and all that kind of thing. And he, and he turns to me and he says, oh, you're just pouring pancake syrup all, all over the top of my head. Which I kind of was, you know, that's, that's a Fredism. <laughs> but I, I was complimenting Fred. That was a genuine thing. I mean, I was really appreciative of Fred. And Fred had done a good job. Flattery is different than that. Flattery makes use of the, rece the receiver's need to be praised or to have his ego stroked, like Jim said. Flatterer desires to manipulate others into doing his bidding or to cover his motives. Flattery gives false praise for the purpose of controlling the receiver. In contrast, a compliment is just a genuine honor bestowed upon another person. It's kind, it's true. It's words that build relationship uh, rather than tearing them down or undermining them. Com compliments are sincere, genuine, and heartfelt, but there's two different things here. Flattery is, is not compliment. Compliment is not flattery. Flattery ultimate, ultimately benefits the giver, whereas compliments are about sincere for praise for the benefit of the receiver. The basic difference is the motivation behind the words. So flattery then is a device. It is a device. You know, the scriptures talk about device. You know, this, I mean, in the Psalms alone, there's probably two dozen places where David prays let them fall by their own device or their own devices or let them fall into the pit that they have dug themselves. So these things, whatever they're doing is, are their devices and you know, that's not to say that they even know. It's not like they're just, um, well, you know, they're not, creating these devices and saying, uh, you know, rubbing their hands together and saying, aha, I'm going to do this to that person. They probably half the time don't even know. They have already been co become dull in their understandings and they believe their own lie. And so they, they're unconscious of the fact that they're using this device. Sometimes they know they're using it. It is, you know, Machiavellian in every sense of the word. It is planned. It is like, if I do this, I will get this outcome, and I'm going to try this on this person. But most of the time, they're beyond that. They have set up something like an idol in of what they will worship, and they have relinquished the truth and turn themselves to this idol and they have kind of forgotten or lost track of the um, belief or the um, the truth of what is what is what has been in their life before and the scripture is very clear about how these flatterers are defined or how they're seen they're motivated to take advantage. They have no faithfulness in their mouth. They speak with a double heart. They speak out of pride. War is in their lips. Their words are drawn swords. They are your secret enemy. Their words are used to force or to control the other. Their words set a trap. And so that's why we see in Psalm 12, 3, the Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh 
proud things. Just listen to every uh, advertisement on TV. It's exactly what you're saying right there. I mean, so they make you feel that you need it. Yeah. And it's a good thing. So I'm just sitting here. Yeah, don't you wish you had a bag of, of uh, Doritos right <laughs> now? I mean, we. <laughs> you do? Well, in the new, t you know, like, this was a thousand years before Christ that this David is speaking this. But we have one of our best examples of what a flatterer is in Luke 18. So I want to go there just for a minute. And this is a parable that, that Jesus spoke to his disciples and to some of the people around him. And he told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, which I think is, I mean, this is where the flatterers live. Uh, and he, they viewed others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like that guy, that tax collector right there. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing at some distance away, was, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. A sinner. And then Jesus, uh, this is a short parable, but it's just packed. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. Who went, to, who went justified? That guy on his knees over there that this guy had contempt for. That guy went to his home justified. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jim, did you have a comment? It's interesting that he, uh, he starts out by saying, hey, look at me, I'm really good. You can say amen, Father in heaven if you want because I know I'm really good and the other guy understood that he was not good and that only only good things came from God and humility is absolutely uh, one had pride and the other one was humble yes humility is kind of like the centerpiece of our of our devotion to God <coughs> I think so let's think about this for a second. Does the Pharisee that's giving this prayer, does he know that he's not going home justified? Does he know of his own injustice? No, he's kind of given. At one point, he, he might have thought something about it, but now he's beyond that. He's already set up his idol, and he's devoted himself to that, and he has let go of the humility of our repose before God. Um, so this type of idolatry, I mean, I don't think that, the, that he did. I, I, you know, sometimes, like I think when Caiaphas said, he says, don't you guys get it? If we kill one man, we will have control of the whole city and the whole country. Okay, that's, that's a, that's a scheming, conniving kind of, you know, ugly politician speaking uh, with malice toward the believers or the people. But I think in this story, 
I don't think that that Pharisee necessarily is just thinking that. I think the Pharisees in general kind of did that kind of thing. They got together and plotted quite a lot. But in this case, it's come to the point where the Pharisee has redefined God as something that he controls. It's more imperative to this worship that they be perceived as righteous, how they appear to others, that's the premier concern. Didn't we see this a lot among the Pharisees? So likely this Pharisee had come to believe this lie that he had participated in creating, I think, along with the help of the evil one, uh, but he has accepted it. And Jesus says he does not go home justified. He is not justified. The humble tax collector went home justified. The Pharisee in this story is the flatterer. And he flatters himself. And he believes the lie. He's given to a delusion, I think. So this is the concern that David has in this petition before God. There's nothing reliable in what they say. It's destructive itself. It's an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. So the Pharisee appeared pleasant. The Pharisee spoke sophisticated words. The Pharisee used the words of prayer. He was, right, he was religious, to be sure. He looked more religious than anybody else. His phylacteries were larger, and his, his, whatever they call those things, that hang down, you know, or lengthened. What? No, not phylacteries, but the, what do they call those things? That, yeah, they're tassels, but they have a name, but I can't think of it. But anyway, they, he had, what are they? They're like that, yeah, but there's a name. I can't, anyway, it doesn't matter, but they dress themselves up you know, to act the part. And just looking at the Pharisee, you might, just from a distance, you see that Pharisee walking into the temple with all that regalia on and looking to heaven and calling on God's name. It looks pretty religious, doesn't it? You might be fooled to think that that is true religion. But his prayer is more honoring to himself than to God. I mean, I think he could almost change the word instead of saying, oh God, I'm glad that I am not like other people. He could change the words just about as easily to, oh Caiaphas, I'm glad that I am not like everybody else. He's put himself into the place of God, I think. And Jesus said, he didn't go to his home justified. And the problem here is this blue part at the bottom. Many were caught in the net that the Pharisees cast into the community. Many were caught. People, unthinking people maybe, or uh, people who were afflicted, or people who were... Um, I can't think of a good word, but they're, they're just not, they're, they're, they're just paying attention to what they see and hoping for the best. They get caught in the net with the Pharisees. And so religion came to be redefined in Jerusalem as this kind of fake thing. Steve? It, it reminds me of politics, actually, the uh, Pharisees and all that uh, sex, that was politics, it wasn't really religion. It seems to take two people um, who have this flattery, Greg, I mean, somebody has to give it, somebody has to be willing to receive it. So if you look even in our own politics, doesn't matter what your thoughts are on politics, politics are a lot about flattery, but we buy into it, right? I mean, we, we buy into it and that's why it exists. So people who are uh, flatterers, which uh, another way to say is insincere, I think is another, good word for that. I mean, it's, I'm saying something that I don't really mean. 
but it's because uh, there's somebody there who's willing to buy into it. They're willing to see the outside of things. Uh, you sometimes see in politics, you see things on, on committed by both sides or every side, and you go, that's not right. <laughs> and yet you find people say, well, sure it is. That's right. And, and I mean, it's like, but do we have the same? I mean, I even see brethren, honestly. I see brethren do that. You know, something that's blatantly wrong, and, and they won't call, I mean, they won't call it out, right? So yeah. if we are complicit in this flattery, then, then we're just as wrong as anybody else. But, but in the Bible, that's what you see. You see, the Pharisees were flatterers. They were um, insincere, but they had the people backing them. Yeah, I just want to tell you that the southern border is secure. That's what I want to tell you. Yeah. We've done all the studies. We've done all the examinations, and we know this. And then you say, oh, okay, well, he's, you know, they've done the studies. <laughs> and so you believe it, but really you should say, well, wait a minute, what about the million people that came up through in the last three or four months. David. The, the people that are anti-religion, that, that uh, you know, are, are down on religion in general, and often they're people that are, you know, naturalists and, and that kind of stuff, atheists, whatever, they say that religion is a tool <clears throat> that is used to control people, much like politics, <laughs> in some ways anyways. And practice this way, they're absolutely right. This is what the Pharisees were doing. They were controlling the people with religion, and that is not, that should not be the goal of, re of true religion, correct? Right. That's all. Yeah, beautiful, because that's, mm -hmm. that's exactly what's happening here. And for some of the Pharisees, you know, they were get, you know, they were well remunerated for being in control of everything. If not in money, they certainly were in terms of deference in the marketplace or kind greetings on the street and all that kind of thing. They were looked up to. So they, that's what they wanted. They wanted the prestige of it all. This is why Jesus said, "Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees." Which, which is hypocrisy, Jesus said. You justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts. For what is it of human esteem? For what is of human esteem is an abomination in the sight of, of God. So I do think that these Pharisees kind of got together once in a while and said, well, if we say this, he's going to say that. We say, we say this, we do this, he'll do that. We've got to come up with a, a foolproof thing to catch him. And then we, if we need to figure out a way to kill him. It's also the reason why God or Jesus cursed the fig, fig tree. which is kind of a perplexing story when you read it. You know, why would God, why would Jesus curse an innocent fig tree? Well, he cursed the fig tree because he was on his way to Jerusalem to, and the cleansing of the temple and the overturning of the tables is about ready to happen. He already knows this. He knows that the people in Jerusalem, the Pharisees and the scribes, who ought to be bearing fruit in God's kingdom are not doing that. They have turned it into something completely different. Now he comes upon a fig tree that ought to have fruit on it. It ought to be able, you know, because I mean, even like, <laughs> I did a bunch of study on fig trees this last week, it's ridiculous. But fig trees, the fruit comes on before the, the leaf on a fig tree. And they, they make these kind of like, almost like almond things that can be picked and eaten and they're, they're quite edible and tantalizing, I guess, to the, to the taste. And then the leaves come on and the fruit ripens later. So there's like kind of a two-tiered fruit thing. So for what it's worth, I learned that. I don't know 
if that's going to help me in my salvation or anything. But um, Jesus walks to the fig tree expecting fruit, just like God came to his temple expecting that those people who are religious would be bearing fruit. Instead, he finds them a den of iniquity. They are, like there's one, that one verse that says, you go to, you know, you travel the land and overseas to make one proselyte, proselyte and then you turn him to a devil once you get him back in your clutches. That's kind of the thing that was happening over there. As Jesus saw no fruit, he said, you know, no fruit will ever grow on you. And then they didn't even discover it until they were on their way back. There was no fruit where there should have been fruit. So I think when we get into this discussion like this, you know, my tendency to think is I tend to think, well, okay, I don't like those flatterers. I know a couple of them, you know. I don't think that understanding this or trying to be aware of, of this idea, it doesn't mean that we're better than the flatterer. It doesn't mean that we need to avoid being around anybody who, who's evil or who is a flatterer. It may mean that we shouldn't take counsel with them. It may mean that we don't want to hitch our wagon there. And I think we should be aware of the leaven of the flatterer. Uh, but we ought to consider, concern ourselves with bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. We're running up here. <laughs> okay. Um, in Proverbs 21, there's a verse that sort of puts me in this vein. If you don't listen to the call of the poor, then when you call, you will not be heard. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like the flatterer is not calling the right things. And when they call for righteousness, <coughs> they won't be heard. Yeah. I just wanted to bring this piece in here, too, because Paul quotes from Psalm 5 in Romans 3. And the red part there is the part that's from Psalm 5. But the context of this is Paul is saying God brought his salvation to the Jews. And he wanted them to be a holy priesthood to him. But instead, they became a den of robbers and idolaters. And then he says, so God opened it up to the Gentiles. And he allowed the Gentiles to be partakers, of which we're pretty grateful for that. Um, so he says, are we better than they, us Gentiles? Are we better than the Jews who rejected God? No, not at all. For we, we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin, as it is written. And then he goes through. Every one of these is a quotation from the Old Testament. There's none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All of us have turned aside together. Uh, they have become useless. There's none who does good. There is not even one. <laughs> their throat is an open grave. With their tongues, they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, and so on. Uh, he's not mincing words here, and he got carried off into that thought. So, the, you know, the idea here is that even in our most righteous posture, 
we ought to be on our knees and looking to God for mercy, as I think David did. So now we come to the end of this psalm, and I don't know, I kind of feel like through this discussion of sepulchers and foul smell and and rotten to the core and everything and I and I I'm trying to explain to you God what I see but I just I'm hear my groanings hear my weepings because he can't really understand it very well but that's okay because God steps in and I think at this last part of this psalm David is mired deeply in this issue, and all of a sudden, a light arises for David right here. And it reminds me of Daniel, and there's a passage that I wanted to share in Daniel 10. Daniel is speaking, then behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words that I'm about to tell you and stand upright, for I've now been sent to you. And when he had spoken, this was like an angel, something like that, speaking to Daniel. He says, and when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. And then he, he said to me, do not be afraid, Daniel. For from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I've come in response to your words. That's what I think of at the end of this psalm. David is trying everything he can to understand this, and then God steps in and says, I solved the problem the minute you even started thinking about it. And he says this. This is, so David just turns completely from this miry, mucky clay that he was in to, but let all take refuge in you, or let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. And may you shelter them, that those who love your name may exult in you. For it is you who blesses the righteous man, O Lord. You surround him with favor as with a shield. Pretty comforting words coming out of it, where he had just been in the psalm. David is always is seeking refuge here. You, you notice that he says he's not just talking about himself. He's not the one that has the problem. He's the king. He has a lot of control in his world, but what he's seeing is the people that are getting captured in the nets. And he says, Look, they won't know how to understand this, but let them take refuge in you. And who is he, who's he talking about? Let them, or let them ever sing, or shelter them, all those who love your name. Uh, surround him with your favor, as with a shield. And then, you know, for whatever it's worth, I, I, this guy, Gerald Wilson, wrote a book on Psalms that I've looked at some, you know, for the preparation of this class. And I, I bring this up mainly because he's from our neighborhood. And I, he's, he's an Old Testament scholar. He taught at University of Georgia initially, but then he came to George Fox and the University of Portland, and then he was at Western Evangelical Seminary, uh, which I think was down in Clackamas area at some point, and he was professor of Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew at Azusa Pacific, still on the West Coast. Anyway, he's best known for his work on this book of Psalms, and this is part of the NIV application commentary series. But he, this quote he, he brings, which I think is good to know that somebody from my neighborhood is propounding these kinds of ideas. He says, we must declare the relentlessness, the, the relentless goodness of God, 
that will never allow evil to have the last word. The biblical message is consistent in affirming the world as broken. This does not represent the intention of the creator. God is not the author of evil, nor is he unconcerned or unable to respond. God is full of intent. Uh, God's full intent is to bring blessing, to bring the good. And David's hope is grounded in this unchanging sovereignty of God. He establishes justice and security. And so David says, you are, be our refuge. He's leading, he leads us in the paths of righteousness. Uh, we have time just for, to look at this Psalm 124. Now this, I think Psalm 2024 is probably, the best I can tell is written sort of, it's just maybe 20 Psalms from, not even 15 Psalms from the last Psalm. So was, maybe it was a later psalm that was brought in. I don't know, but it seems to be, a, it's identified as a psalm of David. And he, I think he's looking back on the time when he had to deal with the flatterers and the iniquity of the people of Israel. He says, had it not been for the Lord who is on our side, who is our refuge, right? Israel, everybody say this, had it not been with the Lord, had it not been the Lord, had it not been the Lord who was on our side, that's sort of a call response thing going on there. When m men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive. When their anger was kindled against us, and then the waters would have engulfed us, the streams would have swept over our soul. Then the raging waters would have swept uh, over our soul. I wrote that in twice. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us to be torn by their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird out of the snare of the trapper. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help, our refuge is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. So this is the place where David ends. I guess we'll end today, but uh, David is saying, stuff is going on, we can't quite get a handle on it. No army is gonna be able to destroy us, and yet it is pervasive in our world. What do we do? We turn to God as refuge. Really turn to God as refuge, as our refuge even in the things that we do not understand. So next week we'll talk about, when we'll, we actually get to move on to a new psalm, Psalm 6, and we'll move there next week. And thank you all for being here today.